For the sake of your eternal salvation, to all your listeners, it is time to turn your AR-15s into plowshares. And- or you could donate them to Armed Lutheran Radio. That would be fine. <laughs> I'll take the chance. Just, I'm willing to risk it on your behalf. <laughs> Bringing you law, gospel, and guns. Welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Welcome to Armed Lutheran Radio and Happy Easter, everybody. Uh, This show is about guns, hunting, competition, and the natural right of self-defense and what God's Word says about the issues surrounding gun rights and gun ownership. I'm your host, Lloyd Bailey, the Armed Lutheran, and this is episode 113, brought to you by Cook's Holsters, American-made custom Kydex holsters with a lifetime warranty and a 100% satisfaction guarantee, cooksholsters.com. Again, welcome and Thank you for making Armed Lutheran Radio a part of your week. As you know, I am a leading Harley Street surgeon, as seen on television. I'm afraid I'm going to have to operate. It's nothing to worry about, although it is extremely dangerous. I should be juggling with your life. I should be playing ducks and drakes with your very existence. I should be running me mitts over the pith of your marrow. Yes, these hands, these fingers, these sophisticated organs of touch, these bunches of five, these maulers, these German bands that have pulled many a moribund unfortunate back from the very brink of Lazarus's box. No, it was Pandora's box, wasn't it? Well, anyway, these mitts have earned yours truly a lot of bread. So if you'll just step through here, I'll slit you up a treat. What? <laughs> Mr. Notlob, there's nothing wrong with you that an expensive operation can't prolong. <laughs> so that's how things are going for me lately. My IDPA season is on hold. I've got surgery scheduled in the next couple of weeks. Had to withdraw from uh, my first three matches, um, one of which... Uh, I'd already paid for and figured out that I was going to have to miss it uh, just in time to not be able to get a refund. Oh, well. But Team Armed Lutheran Radio will be in action this weekend. Sergeant Bill's on his own at the uh, AFSP charity match in uh, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Well, I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that in the coming weeks. Razorback Challenge, the Texas State match. Uh, we'll have representatives at both of those matches in April. Unfortunately, I won't be able to attend. So how's the medical situation going to affect the show, you ask? Well, the next two weeks will be on schedule, episodes 114 and 115. But I think I'm going to take a break for episode 116 on April 22nd uh, and uh, recover before trying to, to get in front of a microphone again. Anyway, so that's what's going on with me, and that's how the show's going to be uh, running the next few weeks. What's new with you? Uh, let us know. Visit our feedback page at armedlutheran.us slash feedback. Send us a voicemail or a, a voice message or an email. We'd love to, to hear from you. Want to talk about something cool you've been doing uh, recently? We'd love to hear about it. So visit the feedback page and get in touch. So um, I don't know whether you heard this in the news, but it turns out the March for Our Lives wasn't a kitty led movement after all. Did you know that? Far from being a representation of the uh, broad swath of the American body politic, the marchers actually represent the same old bunch of gun control people, with um, emphasis on the word old. A survey by the Washington Post, of all places, uh, revealed that only about 10% of the protesters were kids. The average age was my age, 49 Far from being this uh, grassroots movement representing all segments of American society, the march tended to represent just a very narrow group, gun haters and disaffected Hillary voters. The majority, over 70%, were women. 
And they're probably women like the one you're going to hear from on Clinging to God and Guns today. If you watched the video of people who were trying to ask questions of the marchers to kind of find out what it was that they were protesting about, most of the ones that they talked to were women, hysterical women, angry women, women with no clue about guns or the Second Amendment, women who said we don't need guns, you know, the irony being completely lost on them that they were protesting guns but were being protected by thousands of armed security guards and police. The twin problems at the heart of our gun debate today are two things, willful ignorance and irrational fear. These people, particularly politicians and media types, could find everything they need to be fully informed about the pro-gun side of the debate in about five, maybe ten minutes of Googling, but they refuse to do it. And we continue to get people talking about full semi-automatics or how the security at the march are not armed with semi-automatic guns or complaints about high capacity automatic magazines. We get people arguing that the second amendment is really only about government giving themselves the right to arm the military, not the right of the people or about how the five, five, six round fired from an AR 15 creates grapefruit sized exit wounds. These people could easily know the truth. Even if they still believed in gun control afterwards, they could at least make better arguments if they just spend a little time researching. But As a result of that ignorance, they harbor these irrational fears that drive their ideology. While the pro-gun side and typically the right, libertarian, conservative side of most arguments are arguing from fact and reason, the anti-gun side, the leftist side of most arguments, come from fear and ignorance, from emotion. Those two things, fear and ignorance, feed one another. If someone told you that these undetectable ghost guns can be easily acquired by children or felons more easily than buying a piece of poster board, that they're weapons of war designed only to kill as many people as fast as possible, that all you have to do is pull the trigger and spray hundreds of rounds into innocent kids in a matter of seconds without having to stop to reload because of high-capacity automatic clips, and that the 556 five, round or the 223 round shreds human flesh like a plate of pulled pork, you'd be freaked out too. Unless you took the time to question those claims and your preconceived notions and to do a little bit of research, we could actually have a reasonable discussion if the other side of the argument actually took the time to understand the arguments. We have more information at our fingertips, in our smartphones, in these little devices that we carry with us every day, everywhere, than any of our previous generations. And yet, most of society prefers to be completely ignorant of major issues on which, of course, they have opinions. And now we're told that we have to listen to the profanity-laden opinions of teenagers, because somehow they're experts, because they were on lockdown at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School the day of that terrible shooting. They are survivors, so their opinions somehow matter more than others. I'm sorry, but it doesn't work that way. You know, like I mentioned earlier, I've been suffering from gallstones for the past few weeks, almost a month now, but that doesn't make me an expert on how to treat them. I'm just as clueless about what's going to trigger another attack as I was at the beginning. I'm going to be having gallbladder surgery here in a couple of weeks. But I seriously doubt that when I come out of that experience, I'll be an expert in the procedure and can get people to pay me to do operations on them. I've been in several car accidents in my lifetime. One of them pretty serious. I suffered a broken hip and weeks of painful recovery. I suffered, but that doesn't make me an expert on how cars work or the intricacies of highway transportation policy. I've had my identity stolen once, lost a bunch of money. I suffered but that doesn't make me an expert on identity theft or information security or the ways that identity thieves do what they do. Just because people have experienced trauma, it doesn't make them experts on the causes or the prevention of trauma. Hiding in a closet during a school shooting doesn't make your opinions more valid on gun control in the way that surviving a plane crash doesn't make you an expert on aviation safety. The survivors of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Tragic as that story is, they're simply more in a long line of uninformed gun control advocates. The only difference is that they're kids. 
And as a result, they A, are supposedly beyond criticism. B, they think their foul language and insults that they lead with are an effective means of discourse and convincing people that their opinions are correct. And C, they're not smart enough to hide their actual desire to ban your guns and confiscate them. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 5 through 8 says, Get wisdom, get insight. Do not forget and do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, talking about wisdom. She will keep you, love her, and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom, and whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly, and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. The opinions of kids are important. It's important to foster in your children an open mind and the ability to think for themselves. Ostensibly, that's why we send them to school, although they tend to be indoctrinated. But that's why we educate our children. We don't want to stifle their individuality. We want our kids to be able to think for themselves, to use reason and logic, to come to their own informed opinions, to obtain wisdom, as the scriptures say, but also to get insight. Just because they have an opinion, though, doesn't always make it valuable. Your kids may be of the opinion, like mine used to be, that candy and ice cream are the foundation of a well-rounded, healthy diet. That doesn't mean you have to take that opinion seriously. We'll be back with more right after this brief timeout. You're listening to Armed Lutheran Radio on the Self-Defense Radio Network. Guys, let me take a moment to talk. uh, Let's get a little, I want to get a little serious here for a moment. Something really important that you need to consider if you carry a firearm for self-defense. You need to consider legal protection because if you end up in a fight that ends up resulting in you having to discharge a firearm, even if you don't discharge your firearm. But go back and listen to my interview with Paul Lathrop a couple of years ago. Listen to my interview with Marcus Weldon last year. If you are involved in a self-defense shooting situation, even a situation where you threaten to use a gun but don't actually pull the trigger, you may end up in a legal fight after the fact. Even if you're cleared of all wrongdoing, you may find yourself being sued for simply defending yourself. You need to take precautions and to protect yourself and your family. And the, the way I do it, what I trust, is the Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network. Go to armedcitizensnetwork.org and check them out today. They provide legal protection. They provide money to get you out of, to, to cover bail. They provide initial retainers for attorneys. They recommend attorneys for your use in case you ever need to use this service. God forbid you ever do. We carry a gun every day because we hope we never have to use it. This is the same thing. It's a very small fee per year. It's absolutely worth it. Check them out, armedcitizensnetwork.org. It's the Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network. Use the promo code ARMEDLUTHERAN25 and you'll save $25 off your first year's dues. Check them out today. Don't delay. If you're carrying a gun for personal protection, you cannot afford to not have some sort of legal protection as well. Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network, armedcitizensnetwork.org. It's time for this week's self-defense tip from Aaron Israel of Fundamental Defense. Hey folks, this is Aaron Israel with Fundamental Defense here with your personal defense tip of the week. This week I want to talk to you about what you ought to be keeping on your nightstand. How many of you keep a firearm on your nightstand or under your pillow or something like that? Probably a few of you. I know when I was single, before I had kids that I was worried about getting access to my firearms, I probably had a gun on my nightstand, probably had guns sitting out on the table, probably had guns everywhere, right? Because I wasn't worried about kids getting access to my firearms. And you might find yourself in that situation too. Now, a lot of people put a gun on their nightstand because it's kind of a cliche. You hear the bump in the night, you think, I'm going to go search it out. Now, 
you know if you've listened to this podcast and heard my tips that I don't recommend you doing that. I teach the evade barricade respond methodology as it relates to home defense, which means if you can get out of the house, get out of the house. If you can't, for a practical reason, try to barricade yourself somewhere to make it harder for the bad guy to get to you. Find a room in your house where you can barricade. If the guy breaks through your barricade or if you have to as you're trying to barricade yourself or evade, then you might have to respond with deadly force, but it's a last resort. And those aren't necessarily steps, but they're principles. So if you can get out, get out. If you can barricade, barricade. And only as a last resort do we use deadly force. Well, I'm going to read you a story about a guy in New Hampshire who didn't follow this protocol. Matthew Brow, 26, faces two charges of first-degree assault for allegedly shooting Stephanie Tevis, 27, on February 23rd. Prosecutors allege Brow fired two shots from a handgun. One struck Tevis in her right arm and the right side of her abdomen, while the other struck the left side of her abdomen, court documents state. The shooting occurred in the early morning hours of February 23rd at the shooter's home and was written up by Detective Mary Wilson. When Mary Wilson interviewed Brow, the detective wrote, Brow said he and Tevis had fallen asleep together around 10 p.m. Later that night, he said he awoke and he heard footsteps, according to Wilson. Brow stated he immediately grabbed his firearm, which he keeps by the side of the bed. As he turned and looked in the hallway, all he could see was a silhouette. Brow said he yelled, hey, as he fired two shots from his handgun, according to the affidavit. He said he called 911 once he realized it was his girlfriend, Tevis. Tevis later told police she went to the bathroom, got to the top of the stairs, heard Brow yell, hey, and was shot twice, Wilson wrote. After she was shot, Tevis was taken to Cheshire Medical Center in Keene with, life, with life-threatening injuries, then transferred to Lebanon Hospital, where she had surgery, according to the affidavit. She thankfully survived the encounter. And I think it's good that this guy is being prosecuted, and I think you're going to see more and more prosecutions for this kind of a negligent gun use. So what does that tell us as people who have guns for home defense? Well, I'm going to tell you what you ought to have on your nightstand is a good flashlight. A good flashlight. Get yourself a good tactical handheld flashlight. I don't care how many lumens it is, enough lumens that you can see what you need to see. But if you're an all the lumens type guy, then get one with all the lumens. That's fine. Uh, but have that flashlight on your nightstand so that if you hear that bump in the night and you have to go out and move to your barricade spot or as you're moving throughout your house with the lights off, in general, you can take that flashlight with you. What you don't want to have is that immediate access to your firearm when you're barely awake and you can't see things clearly and you're not thinking straight. If you've ever been woken up in the middle of the night by a loud noise, uh, thunder cracking or a dog barking, then you know you're not always in your right frame of mind. So you want to get your gun you know, out of a place where you have to actually wake up to go access it. So I recommend a quick access safe somewhere across the room. Uh, you don't want your gun right there next to your alarm ready to grab in a worst case scenario because first off, you're probably not going to have somebody on top of you like that if you follow good home defense protocol and have a good uh, alarm system and you've got a good door and all of that sort of thing that makes it harder for a bad guy to get in. Anybody who could be right on top of you such that you need your gun in two seconds from when you wake up is probably not somebody that needs to be shot, as this guy figured out. So have that flashlight there with you so you can identify your target and address it as necessary, and you're going to find probably that that person doesn't need to be shot if they're in your house and you didn't get any kind of early warning. Or if that is the case and it is somebody who needs to be shot, then you need to reevaluate your early warning systems and also the security of your doors and windows. So that's my advice to you is don't keep a gun on your nightstand. Keep a flashlight on your nightstand. Put the gun somewhere that you have to be awake and alert in order to access it. And that's your personal defense tip for the week. And happy Easter. Thanks for tuning in. Aaron Israel is a personal defense network contributor and owner of Fundamental Defense. You can find out more and sign up for any of Aaron's classes at fundamentaldefense.com. Hey, if you're like me, you like shopping at gun shows. No pressure from sales staff, no need to bother them to ask to look at stuff. You just pick stuff up and dry fire it and look at it and hold it. Imagine if you could get that experience at your local gun store where you don't need to bother anybody. You don't have to ask people for help if you don't need it. You don't have salespeople hovering over your shoulders. Well, this is what it's like when you shop at G4G Guns. Cassie and Patrick Coburn are the owners, and you've heard them on the program before. They are absolutely awesome people, and they'll help you find exactly the right gear for you. But there's no sales pressure. You just browse the store. You pick up and hold anything that you want to look at without asking permission, just like at the gun show. And once you've found the gun you want, or if you actually do need assistance, Patrick and Cassie are there to help. It's the best of both worlds, gun shop and gun show, in one place. 
It really is the best. G for G Guns. They're located at 2035 Central Circle, Suite 108 in McKinney, Texas. They're open Mondays from 1 to 6, Tuesday through Thursday, 11 to 7. And on the weekends, you'll find them at a gun show near you. Or check them out online at G for G Guns. That's G, the number 4, G, guns.com. G for G Guns, the gallery for great guns. G for G guns.com. Up next, it's Mia's Motivations with Mia Anstein. Hey, everybody. Happy Easter. I hope you all have had a very blessed weekend. Last week, I chatted a little bit about some ways that we can educate youngsters. And I do think this is a very, very important issue because our teachers are teaching our kids and hopefully a lot of you parents are teaching the kids too so that they do know right from wrong. And that's not just in gun handling. That's also in religion. It's very important. There are a lot of people out there who are giving our children bad information and we definitely need to do our part as parents and mentors to keep them educated On that note, I wanted to talk a little bit about the issues that are going on around the country and the people that are trying to ban guns, the youngsters that are trying to speak out, because really, honestly, a a lot of us, and um, I shouldn't say us because not all of us, but a lot of gun owners are kind of discounting them like, oh, they're teenagers, what do they know? And the fact of the matter is they're expressing a feeling. And these feelings, that just might be what causes our lawmakers to take away more of our rights. So we really have to pay attention to these kids and to their feelings. Some of us, as we grew up, feelings were put in check. You knew not to be a crybaby. You knew to, if you fell down, you get back up. But quite honestly, these youngsters have death being shoved down their throats. There are billionaires who are putting money behind the anti-gun agenda, and they are right there to pick those kids up, not to tell them to stop crying, but to say, hey, we will help you do something. So this is something you really need to pay attention to. These kids and their feelings are going to change laws. And I'm bringing this up today because, hey, I have a teenage daughter. I have a 19-year-old who is in college. And guess what? If you go back and listen to some of our episodes, we have a podcast called Mac Outdoors Podcast with Mia and Leah. But I talked to her. We've talked about some gun issues. And she is very pro-gun. But guess what she said in a recent episode? She said when she sits in class, she is afraid. Talk about something that puts chills down your spine as a parent. She is a gun-toting little gal who knows how to handle herself. She's been through self-defense classes. She knows how to look for threats. She knows how to look for an escape route in a building. She knows all of this, but she sits in class every day on a campus that is a no-gun campus, and she is afraid. So you think about that. Um, She's not calling for gun control. What she would like to have is a way to defend herself. How is she going to defend herself if somebody comes? I can tell you that it won't be with rocks. She will not be throwing stones at a man with a gun. And we know that. And that concept is really not logical. It's not the smart way to defend yourself against somebody who comes in with a gun. We also know that statistics show that the communities, and Chicago is the number one example probably in our whole country, the communities where guns have been outlawed have the most violence everywhere. We all know this. Gun owners know this. Something that I want you to take the time to learn is that emotions have a lot more effect than statistics. And quite frankly, these people who don't know gun facts, they don't know the truth. They don't believe us because they don't know who we are. They don't know our histories. They don't know our backgrounds. They don't know that I'm a nice person or they wouldn't call for me to be killed because I'm a gun owner. They don't know that. So 
I think all of us as gun owners, we really, really need to take some time and we need to assess how to control our emotions because a lot of people strike out with anger. They lash out. Um, I'm going to stand with my fist and I'm going to fight for my guns. And you can see the signs. We will pry it out of your cold, dead hands because really, quite honestly, I've had people say, you own a gun, you should die. You own a gun, you have blood on your hands. And no, I don't have blood on my hands. I don't use my guns to kill students or people. Um, So this is something, as a gun community, I hope that you all can think of ways to get in touch with your legislators, um, take them to a range day, teach them about guns, teach them what an AR style rifle is that they aren't all semi automatics, much less a lot of the public thinks an AR is a full automatic, which is already banned. We know that a lot of the public doesn't. I've ran into quite a few people, I've had quite a few conversations, and this is where I'm coming from. We need to do our part to calmly and rationally educate the general public because all they're learning from is the news media and the news media is apparently controlled by the anti-gun agenda. I hope that you all had a blessed Easter. I hope that you are happy because he is risen. I am. I'm blessed. But in the meantime, while we are doing our time here, we need to reach out to others in love, in kindness, and try to help explain to them the logic of gun owners and what being a gun owner is about. Until next week, have a good one, my friends. You can read more from Mia and watch her YouTube videos at MiaAnstein.com. Hey folks, just wanted to take a minute to talk about our membership site. It's the Reformation Gun Club. Uh, Check it out today at gunclub.armedlutheran.us. It's where we put exclusive content. If you want to hear audio that was never released on the podcast, if you want to listen to individual segments, if you want to hear extended versions of our interviews with all the special guests that we've had on the show, if you want to hear extended versions of Clinging to God and Guns, it's a as little as fifteen seventeen per year that in honor of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. You get access immediately to all of the great content. If you go to the website, uh, gunclub.armedlutheran.us, some of the buttons that you click there, the segments buttons and the select your plan button, those are and the different contributor buttons, those are going to take you over to, to Podbean where all of our content is hosted. They handle all of the signups as well. So I know some people have had questions and been a little confused. Don't be. That's where it all takes place. Podbean handles all of the hosting, and it just makes it a lot easier for us. Uh, You get members-only discounts if you sign up today. You get discounts from Cook's Holsters. If you buy through the Armed Lutheran shop, you get discounts on Armed Lutheran swag. You get discounts from easy-to-see targets, Aaron Israel's training classes, Talon Gun Grips, Dow Tech Force, where I get all of my gun belts. You get a basic firearms trust package from 199 Trust for just $59. You get a 10% discount from the gun box, gun safes. I have one sitting on my desk right here. You will love it. Inline fabrication gives you 10% off your orders of $20 or more. Check out the Reformation Gun Club today, gunclub.armlutheran.us. Choose your membership plan, decide what works for you, and take advantage of all the great content because we've got over 270 audio files available immediately if you sign up today, and we add four hours of audio every month. So check it out, gunclub.armedlutheran.us today. Time now for another Ballistic Minute with Sergeant Bill Sylvia. Hey everybody, I'm Sergeant Bill. This is your Ballistic Minute. Hope everybody had a happy Easter. So today we're going to talk about hunting. Yeah, not like deer hunting or dove hunting. We're going to talk about hunting for the front sight. So when I'm at matches, club matches and stuff, you know, I, I watch other shooters. I'm trying to see what they do and learn from them. Well, one of the big things I've noticed lately is people 
when they draw the gun or when they move from position to position, um, they're bringing the gun up and they're hunting for the sight. I really see it big time when they have a optic, you know, like carry optics in USPSA or uh, carry optics in IDPA or something like that. It just is really magnified that they don't have the presentation skills to the, you know, drawing to, and punching the gun out to their sights and the repetitions at doing that, that they should, because they're, you know, gun comes out, it's in position, and they're waiting, there it is, and then they make that shot. I used to have a lot of problems with this, and uh, one of the things I learned a long time ago was the presentation drill. And I know I've talked about this before, but it, it really is important. You think about, you know, drawing to that first shot. You may have a fast draw, but if you can't get the gun on the sights on target, quickly you're not going to have a first shot that is fast if you move from position to position whether it's competition shooting any of the sports or even defensive shooting you're going to be hunting for the sights and trying to you know get on target and make a shot so with the presentation drill you get a lot of repetitions of it it kind of becomes second nature you don't hunt for the sights as much as in your sight picture as much as you would if you don't practice it very much. So the presentation drill. Presentation drill, you can do it from the holster, but the best way to do it is with the gun in your strong hand, you know, basically right after you've pulled the gun from the holster, you know, it's down low in front of you, your your support hand hasn't met the gun yet and it's coming up. So your support hand's ready to take the, the strong hand and the gun. That's where you start it from. So from there, hands meet, you press out, and the gun comes out, to the spot where you're focused. So at the start of this drill, you need to be focused on a specific spot on your target. You know, the more specific, the better, because you're going to have a better aim. Now, as you're pushing the gun out, you should be prepping the trigger or getting on the trigger so that when your sights come into alignment, you're ready to go, and bang, you make the shot. And the last thing you need to do is shift your focus back to your front sight from your target. Now, this is dependent on you know, shot difficulty, target distance, all that kind of stuff. Um, One person might not be able to make a target focus sight at 7 yards, whereas another person can do it at, say, 10 yards. It's something you need to develop in practice, that skill, to see how good at it you are and at what ranges you can shoot without, you know, taking your focus off the target and bringing it back to the front sight. Now, like I said before, you can do this from the holster on your draw, But the best way to work on any specific skill is to break it down to the smallest part. So the presentation drill breaks it down to the smallest part. Your gun's in front of your chest, you press it out, you go to sights, you're prepping the trigger. When I do a presentation drill, I don't even press the trigger and make a shot. I just prep it. And the great thing about this drill is you can get a lot of repetitions in really quickly. Because all you have to do is press the gun out, prep the trigger, bring it back. Take your weak hand off and then do it again. So if you want to get quicker to your first shot, if you want to be able to get your front sight and your sight alignment as quick as possible when you get into position, practicing the presentation drill is something that will help you to do that. And if you shoot different guns, like say you shoot a CZ and a Glock in different sports, You need to practice it with both guns because they have a different grip angle, different sights. You know, they kind of sit in your hand a little differently and you need to be able to practice both of them so it becomes kind of second nature. You will find that when you pick up a gun the first time, if it's a different gun that you've been practicing with or shooting and you press it out, it might not go right to the sights. But if you do this presentation drill a few times, if you've practiced it enough, it'll come right back and you will be going straight back to the sights right where you want them. So if you want to stop hunting for the front sight and your sight picture, when you get into position, you need to practice the presentation drill. I'm Sergeant Bill, and this has been your Ballistic Minute. Sergeant Bill Sylvia is a veteran of the Dallas Police Department and master class competitive shooter. You can watch Sergeant Bill's shooting videos at armedlutheran.us forward slash Sergeant Bill. Hey, if you need a good holster, let me take a minute to tell you about 
my good friends at Cook's Holsters. If you've got um, a need for a holster, for a carry gun, for competition, for a day at the range, check out Cook's Holsters at cooksholsters.com. They're American-made Kydex holsters, custom-made for your specific firearm with a lifetime warranty and a 100% satisfaction guarantee. And trust me, they stand by that guarantee. I know because I've seen it in action. Great people. You've heard Bob Cook on the podcast a couple of times uh, over the last couple of years. He usually comes in at the end of the year on our Christmas show and talks about what's new for the coming year. Um, he makes a fantastic product and you will not be disappointed. Trust me. I have been using their holsters for years. I started, I found them when I started doing reviews of holsters back when in the pre podcast days, back when I was blogging and I just, I love the product and I, and I trust it with my own life. You should give them a shot as well. Check them out at cooksholsters.com. Use the promo code Armed Podcast and get ten percent off your order. Check them out, CooksHolsters.com today. Up next, we're clinging to God and guns with Pastor John Bennett. Welcome back to Armed Lutheran Radio. Time now for Clinging to God and Guns, where we dissect, debunk, and destroy articles and videos that attempt to use Scripture to support a position in the gun rights debate. I'm usually joined by Pastor John Bennett, but it is Holy Week, and Pastor Bennett is up to his eyeballs in sermons and sermons and preparation, so I'm flying solo this week for this episode. Today we're back at Shane Claiborne's Heretic Hangout, Red Letter Christians, it's a website that claims to take the words of Jesus seriously, but instead seriously contorts them to fit their liberal political views. This one comes from Angela Denker from March 15th, and it's entitled Hashtag Enough is Enough. My five-year-old is afraid. And it starts like this. Yesterday, I drove my son Jacob to pre-K at 9.55 a.m., and on our way, we drove through the neighborhood streets surrounding our local high school. As we got closer on the narrow city streets, we were dodging high school walkers. This is normal. We were avoiding student car parkers. This was normal. We were wondering if some kids were ditching class as they walked away from the building. This was normal. As we got closer, we noticed masses of students and teachers huddled around the outside of the building. This wasn't normal. We saw students encircling parts of the building and holding hands. This wasn't normal. We saw them holding up pictures, commemorating dead students. This wasn't normal. I realized it was 10 a.m., and students across America were walking out to protest gun violence in America's schools. Well, <clears throat> let's start right there. This was the big walkout from a couple of weeks ago where leftist schools, administrators, teachers, and parents encouraged their kids to walk out of school and to protest against gun rights. There are plenty of accounts also of kids who did not want to participate in this mess and teachers who spoke out against the walkout. And guess what? They were disciplined. This was not a protest. It was an organized, sanctioned use of children as political pawns. But I digress. Back to our author. I realized that more than 400 people have been shot in more than 200 school shootings since 20 first graders lost their lives in Newtown, Connecticut in 2012. This has become normal. No, Mrs. Dinker. I assume it's Mrs. I may be wrong. Anyway... You didn't realize this quote-unquote fact. You've been spoon-fed this lie, and you remembered it. Because this is, this is who you are. You are an anti-gunner. Moms Demand Action and Gabby Giffords both tell you there have been 18 school shootings this year. So it must be true. No, that's a bogus statistic. And even liberal news outlets debunked this claim weeks ago. And yet here you are spewing it out like you just had some mystical epiphany. At best, I guess that's not really the best way to say that, or at worst, I suppose, there have been two school shootings this year. M maybe three if you count the one that happened in Maryland shortly after Parkland um, that was stopped by an armed school resource officer. Um, 
It's been a crazy morning, she says. Me trying to respond to work emails and to prepare for preaching Lenten service at church. Ah, this <laughs> this explains it. She's a priestitute. Um, Josh, my two-year-old boy, pulling Pop-Tarts out of the cupboard and opening them himself, his newest trick to cover the house in crumbs. That's not a sentence. Jacob, my five-year-old, incensed that we didn't have any condiments to bring for the food drive today. Also not a sentence. What is it with red-letter Christians and their use of sentence fragments? Last week on um, in episode 112, we had the same thing, just a series of non-sentences. It seems to be a pattern with red-letter Christians. Everything felt like it was speeding ahead too fast. A familiar feeling in the life of a mom of little ones in 2018 America. Never enough time. Never enough cuddles. Never enough enough. As we drove, and that's that's true. That's been true of for parents throughout eternity. The, your kids just grow up too fast. That's not something new to 2018 America. Before you know it, your life has gone by and your kids are grown up. It's just the way it is. Ask any parent, ask your grandparents if that's the case, and they'll tell you the same thing. It's not new to 2018. Um, As we drove past the high school, I slowed down next to those kids holding hands around the school. Time seemed to stop. I felt the tears welling up. My own high school experience. What? My own? That's not a sentence at all. I don't even know what that means. I dread to hear what her sermons are like because she must pack them full of these non-sentences. Um, the Columbine school shooting when I was 14 years old, an aberration, an uncertainty, only to become routine for high schoolers of today who just one month ago witnessed Parkland, Florida become the latest in the ghoulish list of murdered promise, murdered innocents. That is an awful run-on sentence. English teachers everywhere are pulling their hair out. What is what does this mean? Well, Columbine was an aberration back in 1999. Today, school shootings happen every day, I guess. No, see, this is what happens when you write stuff based on your own high school experience, based on your own life anecdotes without actually doing five minutes of Googling. We discussed this in the midweek meditation a couple of weeks ago on number 19. You are almost as likely to be killed by lightning as you are to die in a school shooting. These attacks are exceptionally rare, despite what the anti-gunners try to tell you. They cook the books and count things like drug deals gone wrong on school uh, grounds or some guy committing suicide in the parking lot at the school, or stray bullets from the projects across the street hitting the school building, that counts as a school shooting. Mom? Jake asked me, what are those high schoolers doing? High schoolers? I've never heard a five-year-old use that word. I sniffed. Be strong. Don't rattle him. That's right. Be strong. Don't rattle him. Don't stop in front of the school and show him these kids protesting. Move on. Take him to school and get it over with. Remember, Jacob is five years old. So how would you answer young Jake in this question about um, what the high schoolers are doing? How would you answer that question? Would you shield him from the terrible nature of what is an exceptionally rare but horrible attack? Maybe tell him that these kids are, are praying for friends who had been hurt. Or would you, would you wait maybe until you got home to discuss this in a more comfortable setting and where you, can, where you have time to really um, provide some comfort and some explanation to talk about things like sin and evil and how sometimes bad people do bad things and sometimes good people get hurt? Would you comfort him with the words of, of the gospel? Would you explain that sometimes bad things happen, that no matter what, he's a child of God and and Jesus has promised to be with us? Or would you throw caution to the wind and rattle the hell out of your five-year-old so you can use him as a sympathy toy to push gun control? They're holding hands to remember people who were killed in school shootings. Good job, Mom! 
I sensed Jake's brain whirring. He's one of those kids where his thoughts are sometimes too mature for his emotional ability to process them. He doesn't miss a beat, but that's not always a good thing. He's only five after all. Well, before long, he'll be eating Tide Pods and telling people what they should do with their natural constitutional rights. Uh, I digress. Sorry. Um, He's... (laughs) So he's only five, she says, but let's go ahead and scare the hell out of him with lies at this early age. I bit back the tears again as I saw a young girl's face on a poster, too young to die. Mom, am I going to die? Jake asked. Mom, why do kids do that? Why do they shoot other kids? Mom, they're just dumb kids. Why do they bring guns to school? They're going to hurt people. Is someone going to bring a gun to my school? Am I going to die? And perhaps the most heartbreaking, I don't want to go to high school. Yes, this is heartbreaking. And I feel terribly sorry for young Jacob because his mom is a heartless, terrible person. Instead of comforting him with the promises of Christ, instead of explaining how incredibly rare these horrible tragedies are, she decides to to scare him senseless and to use him as a plot device for an anti-gun blog post. Back to the author. This from a kid who has never been able to wait to grow up, who hung out with middle schoolers at church in California, who watches Mr. Ed with his grandpa, who started listening to chapter books for bedtime stories at age five. Nice job forcing your five-year-old to face these difficult adult questions with no context and truth. Um, He can't wait to grow up, so let's just shovel some more fear into him and and make him think he's going to die at any minute. This is great. He started to raise his voice into a slight wail, biting back tears of his own. Nice job, Mom. Right before school. Traumatize your kid. I don't want to go to high school. I reassured him that it hadn't happened here in Minneapolis. Not yet, at least. Though it could happen today, or any day, at his elementary school, or at the high school, or even at my church. Despite my assurances, he knew it deep down. It could happen to him. Dear Lord, what a heartless wench. I am so glad that I'm not Jacob. This woman is awful. You're supposed to reassure and protect and comfort your children, not scare them with your irrational fears. You call yourself a pastor and you shovel these lies onto your kid and scare him to death and make him neurotic before sending him off to pre-K. You're just making sure that your kids grow up needing safe spaces and are incapable of dealing with the real world. One of the things that I've taken away from um, reading the, the combat focus and counter ambush curriculum taught by our good friend Aaron Israel, developed by Rob Pincus, is you don't prepare for what is possible because lots of things are possible. You prepare for what's most likely. And yes, a mass shooting could happen anywhere, but it's also incredibly rare. So knowing that fact, um, It doesn't mean you shouldn't think about it. It doesn't mean you shouldn't prepare for the possibility, but it doesn't mean you scare your kids to death into thinking that this is going to happen to them at any minute. Mass shootings, yes, they could happen anywhere, but it's also so incredibly rare. It's not even likely. Your kid is more likely to die in that car that you're driving. He's almost as, as likely to be hit by lightning. It's possible that ninjas could jump out of your cupboards and steal your cookies, but it's not likely. So why scare Jacob so much that at five years old, he's now deathly afraid of going to school nine years from now? This is child abuse. Back to the author. And this, the most crushing of all cries of kids in America in 2018, he was afraid to grow up here. He's afraid because you've made him neurotic. He's now scared of the entire country, I guess. Good job, mom. Nice work. Would you rather grow up in Venezuela? where kids are digging through garbage to find food, or maybe in sub-Saharan Africa where the majority of the population still poops outdoors, or in the Middle East where your faith will get you beheaded? Is that where you'd like to be? Tonight at church, we're studying John chapter 10, where Jesus reassures his disciples before his death that he is the good shepherd, and the good shepherd cares for his sheep. Even, Jesus says, he will lay down his life for his sheep. That's a weird sentence. Again, this woman must not have any, her English 
grammar grades must have been awful in school. I wonder how many children will continue to lay down their lives for the cowardly adult sheep of America. And where is our good shepherd? Cowardly adult sheep. That is rich. She just explained how she traumatized her five-year-old by convincing him that he could die at any minute in a school shooting while driving in a car where 25% of all unintended injury deaths among children occur. Madam, you are the coward. You're terrorizing your kids with your psychosis. Let's look at chapter 10 in, from the Gospel of John together, starting at verse 7. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go out and find pasture. Now, we use the term sheep frequently in our political dialogue in a derogatory manner. We talk about the Obama zombies, the diehard Trumpists, the gun control advocates. They're sheep. They believe whatever they're fed by the media and by their leaders, and they follow blindly. That's where you get this nonsense about 18 school shootings this year. And the idea that, that there's been a, a, a mass shooting every day. But the sheep and shepherd metaphor here in the Bible, this is different. Jesus is comparing our relationship to him to the relationship between literal sheep and their shepherd in the fields. Jesus is the shepherd. And what do shepherds do? They lead the sheep. They guide the sheep. And they keep them safe. They defend them. The sheep know the voice of the shepherd. They're drawn to it. They're comforted by it. Jesus' voice, his word in Holy Scripture, gives us comfort and guidance. We are his flock and we know his voice because we study his word. Now let's pay attention to the next verse, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, our author talks about children laying down their lives for us, which they are not doing. This is a terrible comparison. Jesus is talking about laying down his life for the sheep. He is not talking about protecting us from physical harm, that he's going to step in and smite the wrongdoers or anyone who might attack us or protect us from illness or temporal troubles, this is prophetic. He's talking about how he is going to go to the cross to die for us, to lay down his life in our place as a propitiation for our sins. Now, as we've said before, God never promised an easy life on earth, despite what heretics like Rick Warren or Joyce Meyer or Joel Osteen will tell you, Jesus didn't promise your best life now. He promised eternal life for those who are baptized and have faith. Now listen to the next couple of verses. This is interesting. Verse 12 and 13. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Kind of like the Broward County Sheriff's deputies who stood by at Stoneman Douglas High School during that shooting and did nothing, and then got into a golf cart and drove away. Placing your trust in people, in government, in those who are not your shepherd, it's folly. Now let's finish up John chapter 10, starting at verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. So he's talking again about about his death on the cross, dying for our sins. So she, our author, asks, where was the good shepherd? And this is a stunning question considering this is someone who claims to be a pastor. You ought to know where he is. He's where he's always been. He was there when that shooting took place, he promised eternal life to those who believe and for those who die in the faith. He was there that day at Stoneman Douglas fulfilling that promise. Whether that death comes at a ripe old age or in a car crash 
or an earthquake or a flood or on some foreign battlefield or in the hallways of a public school. Jesus is there fulfilling his promises. He did not promise us health or wealth or happiness. He promises eternal life for those who believe. He died so that you don't have to accept the punishment for your sins. So how do you talk to your children about evil? Obviously not like this lady is doing it. We talked about this subject back in episode 34 with Pastor Evan Geglin. This was back in 2016. Go back and listen to it. It's an excellent interview, It's in, and it bears revisiting. But I want to share just a brief clip from that episode from Pastor Geglin answering this exact question. It's a sad reality that we, we see school shootings, and it really is. And, you know, we're always asking the question is, what can we do? <laughs> What's in the realm of our control? You know, we, we, would, we would have it if we could— to snap our fingers and there'd be no more poli- uh, no more um, p- uh, school shootings. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, that's not a reality. So we ask, well, what can we do? And so we teach the children, the students in the school, well, these are the little things that you can do to, to uh, try to mitigate a, a situation um, when it arises. Um, I think, first of all, we have to ask the question, uh, what is a real possibility of happening? I think that's a fair question. And then, uh, secondly, just to ask, well, what can we do that would actually help, you know, I mean, to, right. to prepare for things that aren't actually helpful is a big waste of time. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that, uh, first of all, we, we would, would start with what's a possibility and what would actually help. But I think in teaching our kids of, you know, just like we would, you know, what do you do when, when the uh, fire alarm goes off? We teach kids, what do you do? But I also think that you would teach them the first commandment, that we fear, love, and trust in God above all things. So that while we're preparing for uh, the uh, something that could happen, we know that God's going to take care of us no matter what could happen. And that's where our ultimate trust is going to be and is in God alone. So that now the child walks doesn't walk out of school that day in the greatest fear that, oh, this terrible bad thing's going to happen. We can The kid can know, um, oh, well, I'm ready if something bad happens, but I know that God is taking care of us. As, as I'm teaching the, my children the, the Bible stories, mm-hmm. um, we already see embedded in the stories all kinds of evil and bad things that are happening. Um, this will be no stranger to them if they have, you know, if you take some time to kind of teach them what the Bible is all about. And the biblical explanation for evil is uh, the, the, the root of sin itself. So that God had, intent, uh, had intended for us to live free from all sin, and it was our own rebellion against God that brought uh, death and darkness into this world. Um, and so I, this is part of our, our language as we ta- t- teach our kids um, about the Christian faith, that evil exists because of sin. Uh, sin and death exist in this world. And yet, what does God do about it? Well, oftentimes when we think about you know, God doing something about evil— What we expect him to do is to kind of snap his fingers and make all evil cease in the world. And uh, this is the the major question that a lot of people have. Well, if God really exists, why is there still evil in the world? Or why do bad things happen to good people? I think we want to be be cautious with that approach to evil, though, because if you really want to ask the question, how does God define evil? Well, you're going to have to see anyone who falls below the standard of perfection— in light of the Ten Commandments. And any, anyone that falls below that standard is evil. I mean, uh, this also happened uh, in, the, in the gospel where, where Jesus said, uh, you know, you, when your child asks for a loaf of bread, you don't give him a snake, do you? And then, and then Jesus says, uh, if you who are evil know how to provide for your children, how much your heavenly father knows how to provide for you. Now, notice what Jesus just did. He's talking to his disciples, his followers. And he says, you guys who are evil can do this to your children. So, so the, I mean, we would fit the definition of evil. So if we expect God to snap his fingers and just rid the world of evil, that's going to include us. So what does God do about evil? What instead Instead of just snapping his fingers and uh, solving the problem of evil with his sheer might and strength, instead, uh, God takes evil upon himself. He, he, he defeats evil not in the, the strength of might, but in lowliness and in weakness. He, he defeats evil 
by inviting evil upon himself. So that when we see Jesus doing his great work of redemption, it's one of lowliness. It's one of him being nailed to a wooden cross. It's where you see him lifeless and helpless, that there he is defeating evil. Well, how does he do that? Well, there he does away with all sin and all evil and all death, so to reunite, to redeem his fallen creation back to a holy and righteous God. And I, boy, th- this is the wonderful thing for children then, uh, to, to teach them that we would repent of our sins, as all people should, um, and, and believe in the forgiveness that Christ has won for us by his death on the cross. So will you be sharing John 10 with your kids and sharing the comfort and explaining when they have difficult questions about evil and sin, are you going to be comforting them with the words of Christ? Or are you going to be scaring them with the temporal realities and offering them no comfort so that they can join you in your fear and hatred of guns? Which is it going to be? If you have any questions, any comments about what you heard here today, any, any questions or suggestions for articles you'd like us to discuss in a future episode, please visit the feedback page at armedlutheran.us slash feedback. We love to hear from you. We love to get your questions and to respond to them on the air. You can leave us a voicemail or send us a voice message with your, um, the microphone on your computer, or you can um, send us an email. Again, please visit and let us know what you think. We'd love to hear from you. Be sure to tune in again next week for another edition of Clinging to God and Guns right here on Armed Lutheran Radio. John Bennett is the pastor at St. John's Lutheran Church in Willow Creek, Minnesota. For more information, visit stjohnswillowcreek.org. And that's going to wrap it up for this week's episode of Armed Lutheran Radio. Thank you all for listening, downloading, and subscribing. Thank you for supporting the show. Thank you to all of my great contributors for their hard work. Pastor Bennett will be hopefully back with us next week once he recovers from Holy Week and all the work that he's doing this week. Have a happy and blessed Easter, everyone. We will talk to you next week. Until then, keep shooting, keep praying. We'll talk to you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Armed Lutheran Radio. For show notes, be sure to visit our website at www.armedlutheran.us. You can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, and tune in. This podcast is made possible by Cook's Holsters and contributions from listeners like you.